Did you bring a Bible tonight? Good deal, because you're going to need it. Um, let's go to, where can I tell you to go? Go to Matthew 21. Let's start there. Matthew chapter 21, and I'll lead into it uh, by reading a few verses, chapter, Mark chapter 3, Luke 4, Luke chapter 1. Uh, they sort of go together. We are looking at, what did I say, Matthew 21, we're looking at the doctrine of Jesus and who Jesus is according to the Bible. Uh, not, we don't really care about what everybody else says about Jesus. Um, the only thing that bothers me about what people say about Jesus is when they use his name in vain. Amen, that bothers me. My old preacher, Preacher Golf, had a solution to that. When he got saved, I mean, God really worked him over, and God really just made him zealous for, for God, his name, his word, and so on. And he used to work for Procter & Gamble up in Kansas City. And there was a guy up there that he worked with that was all the time saying God's name in vain, Jesus Christ's name in vain. He was doing it all the time. Well, Preacher Golf knew the guy was a Roman Catholic. So you have to know Preacher Golf. He's saved, born again. He's in heaven now, walking on streets of gold. But he had a little mean streak in him. And so he decided, I'm going to fix this guy. So one day, something went wrong with the machine, and he said, well, I'll be Mary." And the guy kind of looked at him, you know, and then he got mad at, or pretended to get mad at something else. He said, well, Mary, 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 that stupid Mary thing, I ought to kick the Mary right out of it. Finally, the guy had enough. And he said, uh, excuse me, but I'm a Roman Catholic, and we venerate Mary, and I'd appreciate you not using her name in vain. And he said, excuse me. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I actually have a verse that says you're not supposed to use my God's name in vain. Show me yours. Amen. True story. Anyway, good to be here tonight. Amen. I hope that whether you've had a bad week or a good week, I hope that uh, I'm thankful that the week has brought you into this place. All of you that are with us online, we love you too. We appreciate you especially and um, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, ask for his blessing. Uh, we have a prayer list tonight. We're going to add a couple things onto that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for a, a gorgeous day. We thank you for the sunshine. And Lord, you've given us rain. You've given us sunshine. You've made the grass green. This is probably the greenest summertime I think I've ever seen. And Lord, what a blessing that is. We know, Lord, that you'll bring forth then fruit out of the ground, that you'll manifest your goodness to this country and to this world. And Father, I know this country does not deserve to have its belly fed. I know this country does not deserve the way we have expelled you out of our schools, out of our congressional halls, out of our judicial halls. Even, Father, out of the White House, we've excused and expelled God out of nearly every corner of this country. And yet, you and your goodness have chosen to bless it. And, Father, we just say thank you for that. We ask, God, that you would give us understanding of that kind of love. And put that in us, Father, the love that loves people when they're not at their best but the kind of love that loves people when they're at their very worst. Father, there's been days when I have been at my very worst, and you loved me, and other people have loved me. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you would help me to love others as well. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these faithful that have come tonight. Lord, they want to hear something, but they don't want to hear it from me. They want to hear it from you. They want it to be sent down from heaven. They want their bread and their manna to come 
from the treasures of heaven itself and not from me. And I pray, dear God, that you would give those who are seeking that exactly that and give that to them in abundance. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the great things that you've taught us, all the years, Lord, that you've been trying to teach us. And Father, yet we ask for more. There's more that we don't know than what we do know. Or remind us of things, Lord, that we once have forgotten. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless all of those that are troubled tonight. And I pray, God, that you would give them rest. Be with all of those, Lord, who are sick, and I pray that you would give them healing. Be with those who need comforting. And I pray, dear God, that you would give them comfort. And that all of us, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Father, for without hope, there's no reason for us to be here tonight. But we hope, Father, for the things that are not seen, but we believe them anyway. We ask you, dear God, to increase our faith and increase our hope that your righteousness imparted to us, Lord, and your grace truly is sufficient for all of our needs, all of our trials, all of our tribulations. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would open up your hand wide and feed your creation tonight. God, that you would just bless your people and fill our hearts with your goodness. Show us some good things tonight that will carry us through. Carry it not just throughout this week, but, Father, for the rest of our lives. Give us this night our daily bread, such as we have need, and prepare us for days to come. Help us to love one another. Help us to pray for one another, forgive one another, forbear with one another. We ask you to do these things, Lord, until you return in heaven to call our name out. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Um, Jesus is the Son of God. Now, contrary to doctrine like Jehovah's Witness doctrine and probably Mormon doctrine, and I know of some of the Hebrew roots, people and their doctrine contrary to that they say that even though he's been given the title of the son of God it's just a title it does not really mean that he of course is deity but I beg to differ with you he is referred to consistently throughout the scriptures as the only begotten son he is begotten of the father which means that who God is Jesus is, and they're really, even though we believe that they are unique and that they are different from one another, they are the same as one another. This is a big mystery. I don't quite understand it, but I do believe it, and I believe every word of it. So we believe that Jesus, and we, this is what we talked about last Wednesday night, we believe that Jesus is the mighty God. He is the mighty God. Now, um, we talked last week also about how the devil, when he's tempting Christ, he's tempting Christ in the form of, if you're really the son of God, then do this or perform this or turn this or do whatever it is. But he's questioning whether or not he really is the son of God. That is one of the things that the devil does. If you remember Genesis 3, he'll doubt the word of God. In the New Testament, he will doubt the Son of God. And if he can destroy both of those doctrines, he thinks, then he can win some great thing. We actually have a story about that tonight. But here's what's interesting. While you have the prince of devils, Satan himself, Belial, uh, Beelzebub, the dragon, the old serpent, Satan, while you have the devil himself doubting whether or not Jesus is the Son of God, you have devils who are saying, of course he's the Son of God. And I may have touched on this last Wednesday night, but very quickly, Mark chapter 3, verse 11, unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Luke chapter 4, verse 31, And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. They know who the boss is. They know who the king is. They know who the Messiah is. They knew 
When Jesus showed up, there was no question, Jesus, what have we to do, thou son of the most high God? In Luke chapter 1, the angel uh, Gabriel that went to Mary to announce to her that she was going to give birth to Christ, the angel answered and said unto her, the power, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I mean, after all, where did he come from? Now, my class in the Birds and Bees 101 went like this. In order to have a son, it takes a father and a mother. Okay? It takes both. Now, we know that Jesus had a mother. That mother was Mary. She was responsible for his humanity. But then Jesus also had a father that was responsible for his divinity. And so what do we believe? We believe that Christ is fully man in every way. Did he bleed? When he got cut, he did. Okay, did he spit? Yeah, he spit. Did he get hungry? Yes. Did he suffer pain? Yes. Did he stop breathing? Yes. All of those things. And yet, there wasn't anything about him that wasn't God, that wasn't divine. He exhibited the aspects of humanity, but he also exhibited the aspects of divinity. So he was fully God and fully man at the same time. So that's, you know, this angel said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And those, see, the spirits know that Jesus, the spirits know, both the good and the bad, they know who Jesus is. Now, let me ask you a question. I never really thought about this. Do you think, and it probably means nothing, but do you think that Satan really did know that Jesus was the Son of God, but that he was just doubting for the sake of maybe those who would read or those who would or whatever? Do you think he was just putting on that he knew that Jesus was the Son of God? In other words, when Jesus was tempted, Satan said, if thou be the Son of God. Do you really think that the devil didn't know that he was? Anybody got an opinion on that? You think he knew? Okay. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. You can walk right out that door. No, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's possible. He may have just been putting on. He's the father of lies, is he not? Because when he said, Yea, hath God said. I mean, I think obviously Satan knew exactly what God said. I think Satan knows what's in the word of God, don't you? His problem is, there's parts of it he don't believe. Okay, parts of it he just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't want to believe, doesn't have to believe, is not going to believe, or, what, or thinks he can usurp the word of God or whatever. But yeah, it could very well be, George, that he actually did believe that he was the Son of God. I mean, we know that Satan came at times into the presence of God. He did it in the book of Job twice. So obviously he would have seen Jesus there at the throne of God, at the right hand of God. He would have seen Jesus there, so it's, it's, it's possible that that he really did know that he was the son of God. Now, why is it important? Take your Bible, turn to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Jesus, the, the parables, if you ever want to know what parables are about, uh, let me tell you what parables in the Bible are not. Parables are not fables. They are not fables. They're not Aesop's fables cunningly devised fables. They're not storybook fables. They're not myths. 
They're not made up legends or make believe stories. Parables are actually real events that have some sort of heavenly or spiritual or doctrinal meaning behind it. How do we know? Well, Jesus, when he would teach parables, he would say things like, there was a certain rich man. And he's not saying, let's pretend that there was a certain rich man, or let's make believe there was this guy, or suppose that someone was this way. He would say, there was a certain rich man, or the kingdom of heaven is likened unto, and he would give a specific example. So I think these parables that Jesus taught, this is really, I think, important. If we believe the Bible is telling us stories that are not true, and yet they mean to convey something that is true, how would we be able to tell the difference what part of it's true and what part of it's not true? I don't think God is capable of lying or making up a story. Do you? God cannot lie, the Bible says. So I think these stories, unless you see or read something like, well, I don't even know how it would be put, like as where the Bible would say, as if a certain rich man or something like that. I think then maybe you could say, well, maybe that didn't really happen. But in all these parables, he didn't say that. He said, there was a certain this, there was a certain that. So in this case here, here another parable. In Matthew 21, 33, there was a certain householder. Guess what? There was a certain householder. And you know there was because Jesus said the first two words, there was. The fourth word he says, certain. I know who he is. I could name names if I wanted to. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it. Remember what vineyards represent. Vineyards represent uh, the word of God. You have the two vines. You have the vine of Sodom. You have the vine of Christ. One of them's the true vine, Jesus Christ. The vine of Sodom is full of lies. It's full of dragons, poison. It's bitter. Its clusters are, are full of bitterness. They taste like wormwood. They're very bitter. They're intoxicating. And the fruit that they produce is the fruit of sin. Whereas you have Christ, the true vineyard. I am the true vine. And what the fruit that he produces is righteousness and truth. A vineyard could be a church, a vineyard could be a family. I think a vineyard could be a nation in, in many aspects. But anyway, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged... John, what's the purpose of that hedge around that vineyard? Okay, are there varmints that steal grapes? What kind? Birds? Raccoons? They steal grapes? Okay. So lots of things that would steal the grapes. And so he hedged around about it. He protected it. Digged a wine press in it. And built a tower and let it out to husbandmen. And went into a far country. He let it out. Which means he, he rented it. So that he wouldn't have to work it. The guys that worked it then. Would receive a portion of the harvest, but then the owner would also receive a portion of the harvest and he didn't have to do anything. He's like a, a financier or a financial backer of something or a share crop or something like that. So he went into a far country and when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took the servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. You understand what's happening here? The man who owns the vineyard sends his guys out to go and collect the grapes from the vineyard or the wine from the vineyard. When he sends them out, the guys who worked that vineyard beat him up and said, this is our work, you're not taking it. So in verse 35, and he... And 
Uh, the husbandmen took his servants, beat one, killed another, stoned another. Verse 36, and again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Verse 37, but last of all, he sent unto them who? His son. And look at what he's saying. Saying, they will reverence my son. Who's this parable about? Yeah, the prophets of Christ and the Jews. God sent Isaiah, God sent Ezekiel, God sent Hosea, Malachi, God sent Moses, God sent Jeremiah, God sent these men to warn Israel, his servants, the prophets, the Bible says. God sent these men out to preach the gospel to Israel, to teach them of God's ways, God's truth, God's righteousness, and all they did was beat them, imprison them, had them killed. That's all they did. So he sent other servants. Finally, he said, they will reverence my son. So verse 38. But when the husbandmen um, saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. Now understand, understand this story, what he's telling you here. This is the, re here's God sending his only begotten son. And he sends them, he sends Jesus basically to a pack of wolves in sheep's clothing. They have no intention, on, they, they've mistreated every prophet that God sent having them thrown in prison or having them killed, despising them, despising their prophecies. We remember the, the showdown between uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal there. And when it was finally shown that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the God and Baal wasn't, even though Elijah won the contest, he still ended up fleeing for his life. And he gets out there and he says, Lord, it is enough. Um, now, you know, I hope and pray that I get to die for I'm not better than my father's. They seek my life. They want to kill me. So God, why don't you just kill me and get this over with? And that's how he feels. So anyway, this is the air. Come and let us kill him and let us seize on an inheritance. That's the purpose. Why did Satan enter into Judas Iscariot? Why did Judas, why was it in Judas' mind in the first place to betray Jesus Christ? Why was it there? Was it totally Judas' plan the all along and Satan just said, hey, I think I'll, this looks like a good idea, I'll jump in on it? No, it was Satan's plan from the beginning. Uh, hold your place there in Matthew and turn to Genesis 3. This is um, the, really the first, what I call direct prophecy. You have a direct word from God saying, this is what's going to happen. It's, uh, they call it the proto-gospel, the proto-euangelion, it's the Greek word for it, proto-gospel, whatever. But anyway, in Genesis 3.15, God is saying to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the devil then knows this. He knows that at some point, born of a woman is going to come one who is going to bruise the serpent's head. So with him knowing that that's going to take place, all he has to do is kill the seed of the woman, God's son, kill whoever that's going to be, and then that prophecy becomes null and void, and then the whole thing's off. Then Satan gets all of it. He gets the whole universe. He gets everything. 
And that's what they're, that's, this is the thinking now. If you, uh, this is why I believe in conspiracy theories and why I read the Bible to get my conspiracy theories. Because they just make more sense from the Bible. There's a conspiracy here, isn't there? A conspiracy to kill the son of the one who owns the vineyard. Why? Because if we kill him, we get the vineyard for ourselves. You know, think about it. Ezekiel 28, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Isaiah 14, 12, I will be like the most high. He thinks he can accomplish Godhood. He thinks he can be God. He thinks he can be the replacement for God. Whatever it is, God, he thinks he can sit on God's throne. Dagon, the, the false god of the, of the Philistines, having brought the Ark of the Covenant, had the Philistines bring that Ark of the Covenant to him so he could take possession of it. That didn't work out so well, did it? And it's not going to work out well here, but that's the plan. Any way, shape, or form that the devil can use to dethrone God, that's what he'll do. And that's your one all-encompassing, great big giant conspiracy theory. Not that the world is flat. That's not the big conspiracy theory. The big conspiracy theory is, I will sit on God's throne. And if that means I have to kill God, then so be it. So, back in uh, Matthew 21... This is the heir, let us kill him and let us seize on inheritance. So verse 39, and they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Verse 40, when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And Jesus is telling this story now and he's not, he's not died on the cross yet. He's telling everybody what's going to happen. He's just letting them know how it's going to turn out. So in verse 41, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will not and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said, that's a great, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Because that is exactly what I'm going to do to all you Jews. Jesus said to them, did you... Um, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. We were having dinner with some of the families left over from homecoming. And they were saying to us, you know, they said, you know, we caught on. When we were in all these other churches, we caught on to something, Brian. That while they said, you know, we use any translation here, that wasn't totally true. We use any translation here except the King James Bible. They don't touch it. They don't use it. They don't read it. They don't have it as part of the verses up on the wall. They don't have it in the Sunday school literature. It just, for some reason, doesn't show up in anything that they do. So I submit to you that your Bible is more than just a book to read. I think it's the stone that the builders have rejected. What does the Bible say? Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. And if they build it and they're not going to use the true stone, the tried and true cornerstone, and remember what that, remember what a cornerstone is, and we're not talking about the capstone on a pyramid either. We're talking about the very bottom stone on any given corner, you just pick a corner, put it somewhere, but on that corner, that stone has to be exactly 90 degree angle. Did I say it? It's 90 degrees, right? 
Yeah. Has to be exactly 90, 90 degrees. Got it. That way, this wall is going to be straight this way, and this wall is going to be straight this. And once you have this one, this is going to be easy to, to build the other corners. All you have to do is match this one. But if this one's wrong, what's, what's going to be the matter with the rest of the whole house? Whole house going to be wrong. And gravity always pulls down. And because that stone isn't trued and tried, it's not 90 degrees, it's 90 degrees and 1% off. But the longer that wall is, the worse it is gets and that stone has to be absolutely spot on perfect or that house is weak and it will never stand but as long as and this is this is engineering 101 engineering says that gravity pulls straight down does it not gravity doesn't pull down at an angle it pulls down straight down so if your walls are square and plumb and level, when gravity pulls straight down, it's pulling down equally on everything that has made that wall, and that wall will last. Funniest thing we ever saw. I don't know if you remember this, Sterling. It's back when Gene Cadenhead and his dad did this. There was a house at Home and Farms where when they poured the foundation and they poured the, the, uh, the foundation for the fireplace, the foundation for the fireplace was off by about that much. Now how many guys going to lay brick on that? They got to lay brick on a foundation, Brian, that's off by about two or three inches. Okay, they ended up having to make the brick straight. But then you can tell that the foundation is bad and it's off. And you've got a whole section there of that corner of that brick fireplace. It's not going to last, not going to work. I don't know how that, I, I don't remember how they sold the house. I don't know what they did to it. But there's no way in the world I would have bought that. Amen. And that's Christ. And that's this book. He, this book is the stone that the builders are rejecting right now and won't last. Whatever it is they do in people's lives, it may look good for a while, but it won't last. It'll decay. It'll crumble. So did you ever read in the scripture, stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, meaning the Jews, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever, and here's what I like, and I like the meaning of this. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. And there's been several times in my life when I've had to fall on that stone and be broken. Had to be broken over my sins. Had to be broken over my laziness. Broken over my pride. Broken over my, uh, my not caring or whatever it was. But I had to be broken. That's better than having that stone fall on you because look at what he says in verse 44 whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder hold your place there turn to where am i going next anybody know huh no that's the stupidest thing i ever heard of in my life why would i go to exodus daniel yeah, I don't know what you're thinking. What's in Exodus? Oh, yeah, no, no, uh -uh. You, you're way off. I don't know what preacher you've been listening to, but 
Daniel chapter 2, turn there. Look at verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over of them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Look at verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, and a part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Verse 44, verse 44, interesting. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be not left to another to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces. Now do you see why I said Daniel 2? That's the stone... In, in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, he sees these four kingdoms. The gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, and the iron and the miry clay. And then he says, says he sees a stone cut out without hands. Meaning God did not make him, or excuse me, man did not make him. Jesus was not invented by man. God. He is God. Amen. He's everlasting. He comes and then he smashes the toes of this image and it falls and is ground into powder and that is exactly i think what jesus is referring back here in matthew 21 44 on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder and once it's in powder then it's blown away in the dust and it's gone and and never to be put back together again Never to be put back together again. So the importance of God's son. They, the devil t shows you the importance of God's son. Because Jesus is always the number one target of Satan and his working. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. But in every place in this nation where the ACLU and the people for the American way and all and the people for the separation of church and state all of these groups when they start whining and crying about how America and its government are to be separate from religion nine times out of ten they're talking about the Christian religion not separate from anything else I mean my goodness they're teaching yoga in public school classes they're teaching mindfulness in public school classes. You know what that is? That's Eastern mysticism. It is religious practices being taught in public school systems. And I guarantee you, if a teacher showed up in his class and said, uh, yes, I'm going to teach you the Lord's Prayer out of the Gospel of the book of Matthew, there'd be a lawsuit on that school and that teacher would get fired. But now that she wants to come in and teach her students yoga and mindfulness, which is nothing more than getting in contact with familiar spirits, when she wants to do that, oh, that's, that's not religion. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just, a, that's just a better way for them to think. It's not that they're against religion. It's that they're against the Bible's religion. You can be guaranteed of that. You have schools. You have public schools in America where they allow the students to pray five times a day facing Mecca and in some cases make them do it. So they're not against religion in schools. They're against Bible religion in schools. The devil hates the Son 
of God. That's how you know. How, how do you know you have the right God? It's the one that all the other religions hate. How do you know you have the right Bible? It's the one that all the other churches hate. Amen? Amen. So you got the right Bible and you've got the right God. Because it's the one that's hated by everybody else in the world. Somebody say amen. Amen. The Ethiopian eunuch. Turn there very quickly and I'm going to let you go. Now, I'm going to give you an example of what I just said. Philip was told to go and get up and start walking. Philip doesn't know where he's supposed to go, doesn't know who he's supposed to meet, doesn't know what he's supposed to say, doesn't know anything. And can I suggest to you that God likes us that way? Amen? If God would have told you about some of the days that you have encountered in this life, would you have voluntarily gone through them? Nope! Not a chance. So you, Roland, so God's not going to tell you. So you be like Philip. God says, Philip, get up. Walk out of the house. Turn left. Start down the road. I'll show you what to do when it's time. That kind of trust. I like that kind of trust. God it probably is best that you don't show me what's going to happen because I'll fight you the whole way. So Philip does that. He doesn't know he's going to be, he's, he doesn't know he's going to need to bring a copy of the book of Isaiah. He doesn't know he, he needs this. He doesn't know he's going to be doing this. He just goes and does and he meets this Ethiopian eunuch on his way to Jerusalem to worship because that's what God said in his law. The guy's following the law. So he's in his chariot reading. Philip can see he's reading the book of Isaiah. Philip says, understand this what thou readest. Eunuch says, how can I accept some man show thee? And the Holy Ghost is going, guess who that man is, Philip? Well, that would be you. So Philip joins the man in his chariot and the reading Isaiah 53. Whom shall, who, ha, who hath believed our report? To whom sh is the arm of the Lord revealed? And the eunuch wants to know, is he talking of himself or some other the Bible says, Philip, that place began to teach and to show him Jesus Christ. So they came to water. Uh, verse uh, 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet of this, of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And skip verse 37. Skip verse 37. Because in the original best manuscripts, verse 37 has been omitted. Right? No, I think we ought to read it. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Take that verse out and then put verse 36 and 38 together. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stand still and he went down both into water. Nothing about faith. Nothing about what you got to believe. Just obey what the priest tells you to do and then you might, you might have the hope of salvation. Put that verse back in and then you understand. What I've, I mean, I make it a point. I was taught well by my pastor predecessors who said, I don't baptize anybody except I go through the scriptures and they understand that that water doesn't save them. And if they think it does, I'm not baptizing you until you figure it out. So anyway, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's one of those. See, what I just said was the devil likes to bring doubt upon the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Hence, verse 37 is omitted out of 
the New National Version, the New American Standard Bible, the Christian Standard Bible, the English Standard Bible, the New, did I say NASB, the Message Bible. In fact, every modern translation of the Scriptures, verse 37, has been tossed. So now, you don't have to believe anything, just get water baptized and you'll be okay. I'm telling you, the devil hates Jesus and he hates his word and wants to try to cast doubt on both of them. Amen? Amen.